So let's review what we did today here, plus we'll talk, we'll show the error associated with the crank nipple some of it, right? So again, the first equation up there is where we stopped last time, and then we want to convert that into an equation that has units of flow rate. And so we just multiply by this constant, rearrange, get the equation on the bottom, then we just give them some labels, right? So this sort of looks like Darcy's law, so that, is, that has to do with the transmissibility of the problem. These are parameter properties that have to do with the accumulation, right? The volume of the grid block times the porosity is the volume of fluid in the grid block times the compressibility over the formation volume factor. That has to do with the volume accumulation, okay? So we just label them Bs and Ts, rearrange. This is what the equation looks like for the ith grid block in terms of those constants. If we write down the equations for four grid blocks with a Dirichlet boundary condition on the left, what is the Dirichlet boundary condition? Constant pressure. And a Neumann on the right, what is a Neumann? Constant flux. Understand that constant could be zero, right? Zero flux. Okay. So these are what the equations are for a four grid block system. And then we can see that it's a linear system that we can write in matrix form. There's the matrix equations. Here's the final set of equations. Notice that the accumulation matrix is diagonal. So later when you see it's inverse, it's just one over the diagonal entries. There's just a unit analysis that shows that it is in fact units of volume per day. Volume for time. So there's just the process for both the explicit and implicit methods where we just basically multiply the constant through by the first equation, then we write it in matrix form, and then we rearrange so that we have we can clearly see that we have a matrix times PM plus one on the right hand side and a matrix times PM plus one on the right hand side in both cases, and then you can see what the it's easy to see what the solution is in that. So both methods have order delta x squared in space and, do, and delta t in time. The explicit method, even though we change it to rate form, that parameter eta still has to be less than a half for stability. Right? So it's still conditionally stable. This is unconditionally stable. Right? So there's another point I want to make here. All right. Unconditional stability means that the errors don't grow, right? So I can take as large a time step as I want, and the simulation won't blow up. I'll get an answer. It doesn't mean that the answer will be accurate. Right? The accuracy is associated with on the order delta t. Right? So then adding the explicit and implicit together, or essentially averaging them together, through this parameter theta, then I get a mixed method. Right? So if theta is a half, then I get the crank Nicholson method. Right? So it's essentially the average, the, the average of the two equations exactly. Right? And then here's the analysis. So the the the, the crank Nicholson method is sort of like doing a central difference in time over. Uh, it's sort of like doing a. a, a central difference in time over, or computing the time at the p n plus one half time step. And so then you see that eventually the analysis gives you that you have order delta t squared accuracy in space there. I'm, I'm sorry, in time, in time, in time.
Yeah, it, it, it's it's not unconditionally stable. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to determine. Uh, it, you know, it's 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 not as easy to determine what you know the eta parameter is. There's something called a CFL condition associated with it, but it's it's not un unconditionally stable. So here's some solutions. 1D diffusivity equation, the implicit compared to the analytic. And so what, what, what we do to do these error analysis, so we only have like a minute left, but what we do is we, you have the analytic solution, right? And then you have the numerical solution. Now you can evaluate the analytic solution at discrete points, and you can compare those to the same points that you're solving the numerical solution, and then you compute some type of Normed error. Usually, it's like an L2 error. Okay, so it's like the sum of it's like the Euclidean distance norm, right? And then you can do that, and you can continually refine the grid. So in this case, we're refining delta x, making it smaller and smaller and smaller. And all of these points are associated with the L2 error. The L2 error associated with making the grid smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And what you'll see is that when you draw a line through all of those guys, the slope equals two second order accurate, right? The spatial is proportional to that, right? So then you can do the same thing for time. The slope equals one. Uh, for the for for each each method. Okay? So that's where we'll stop. <laughs>